<laughs> Welcome to the Urban Pharmacy podcast, Kyle. <laughs> For those of you that are watching on YouTube, Kyle is playing around with filters on uh, Zoom, and he had just had a plant on his head and some sunglasses on, but... It's 6.30 on a Friday morning and mm -hmm. Kyle and I decided to have an episode together. My son is in the office. He's supposed to be quiet and uh, we'll see how this goes. But you know, I get a lot of questions about backyard gardening. I get a lot of questions about what Kyle does. And we've already had an episode with Kyle early on in the podcast last year, but it wasn't in the springtime and we're going into the time that people are thinking about starting seeds and getting their gardens, backyard gardens, or like full-fledged farms going. And I wanted to ask the master himself, you, my love, how is the farm going this year? What's happened? Why don't you just tell us all the things? Because I think it's been an interesting adventure with green growers this year. <laughs> sure. Well, I don't know where to start. My camera's flaking out, so I'll do my best. But um, <laughs> okay, so the year in review. Let's start with uh, what what went well. So this year we um, hi hired another person to help out, so that really helped boost production um, and actually help us get to the point where we, I wanted to be with being able to start some processes and really start to expand and become efficient. So we uh, spent a lot of time building out new beds, working on process that we can then rinse and repeat for next year. So that was a good thing. And then also um, this year, we finally had some awesome success with our cabbage and mm. fall broccoli. So I've never really had the chance to grow much scale or volume of those two crops. And I think we knocked it out of the park. We made some changes to one of my old cultivating tractors. It's probably 60 plus years old. And uh, it really, really, really helped us um, compete with weeds and, and really have a good crop. So next year or 2022, whatever year we're in now, uh, we're gonna hope to rinse and repeat that and add um, some spring broccoli early, some spring cabbage, and then add to the fall, add some Brussels sprouts, uh, and maybe some cauliflower. We'll see if that works this year too. So I'm excited about the cold crops. Yeah. And, um, and then now, so now things are really cold and dark. And sadly, one of our greenhouses was uh, torn apart with windstorm in December before we left for vacation. So everything in that house was what I was intending to sell at the market this time of the year. So that's kind of a bummer because you know, all everything in there is trash. So hopefully this weekend we can get the plastic on it and get things prepped and start planting again. So, you know, kind of moving towards spring planting, you know, I want to get some arugula started already. Uh, hopefully this, like I said, next week and some spinach again, and then go ahead and move some lettuce over and get some lettuce started again. And then that way I can prep for tomatoes. And I want to get tomatoes done in late February or early March and crank up the heat in the greenhouse and try to get some early tomatoes. So now that's something that most, you know, home growers aren't going to do. I mean, growing tomatoes in Indiana, it's one of those things where you shouldn't really install them outdoors until almost Mother's Day. Mm -hmm. yep. Last Mother's two years, Day. we've had a late, a late freeze. You know, we've had good weather up until May. And then all of a sudden we get this really hard freeze and it kills everything. So you know, if you're doing some home gardening, um, you can start in early May if you want, but just be able to cover it, have some plastic available, build some little low tunnels and be able to go out and cover your plants. That way, if we do have a cold snap in, in the middle of May, you know, things aren't ruined. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So let's, let's back up a little bit there. We're in what zone? Cold zone. Five B, six. Yeah. Five B is what I was going to say. B, like... I can't remember anymore. Pretty sure we're in 5B here in central Indiana. Um, and why, let's back up to the broccoli and the, and the, the, the cabbage, because I will say the, the broccoli was ridiculously good. If, if you as a home gardener or a beginner farmer are looking to do colder crops, I highly suggest just starting, even if it's your first year, start 
try to get good at doing broccoli and these storage crops like cabbage because they are pest they are not pest resistant they, they, they are pet they're pest susceptible and um how did you overcome that how did you overcome that this year versus other years i know i know the years prior the broccoli like just didn't like the heat so it's just really temperamental with temperature um well, years years passed with broccoli i tried to plant it too late in the spring. So I wouldn't get it in until late April or May. And then by the time it was close to being ready, it was June, July, and it was scorched and it was, you know, bolting and, and just doesn't like the heat. So yeah, uh, at home, the best way to, to manage uh, crops that are susceptible to pest is to have some row cover, some thin cover called Agrabon or some insect netting that you can put over those crops and, and keep the fly, the white fly or some of the other, um, you know, flying insects away from them so they don't lay eggs in the in the product. Yeah, that's so, the uh, on the MI scale. We've got some organically approved um, sprays that we can use that are bacteria, and we'll use those as needed if we see pressure. Yeah. Um, so with okay, so with that said, let's talk a little bit about low tunnels you were just like yeah you know you need to build some low tunnels like what people don't know what that is so let's go back to when we started doing um the little backyard garden here and um you know i have these raised beds which we've talked about on a previous episode but they're like 10 feet by two and a half or maybe even three feet which might be a little bit too like deep but they are just raised beds with wood that we you know screwed together and put dirt inside. We put some um, landscape fabric down at the bottom of it to try to keep weeds from growing up through the bottom. And we put compost in there. And then here's the deal. If you live in a zone like us, where if you've started seeds inside, which I want to talk to you about, Kyle, if you've started seeds inside or you get plant starts from maybe your local plant sale, um, which you should look for, uh, maybe your you know local 4-H has a plant sale in early spring. A lot of the times you can't put these crops out too early, especially like tomatoes. Like we, you might have a late frost, and we need to protect these crops from freezing because they won't survive, and then they obviously won't grow in the summer. So, um, how did we build? I mean, I built, and you helped me with just a few little bends of the PVC pipe. But like you could build something to protect your crops as easy as literally taking a pot and putting it over each plant. Like say, if you have a raised bed and you have like three or five tomato plants, you can put a pot over it to keep it um, from freezing. That is a good way, especially if it's like a black plastic um, plant pot that will keep the soil warm. Just be careful not to scorch your plant. But what we did was took, uh, what was like the base of it, Kyle? It was like two by one pine or something like what do we call those things yeah well you really don't even need that i mean really all you need is something that can bend it's flexible and then plastic or, or some something you can cover it with so um even a shower curtain if you have a small raised bed garden so when i say plastic i'm talking like um one inch pvc plastic or um pex tubing you know that you can get at the hardware store that's used in home homes for like their water, water system. So, you know, inexpensive, uh, just something that's, that's flexible that you can bend and make a hoop with. Yeah. And then just stick those stakes in the ground or the ends of it in the ground, and then just cover it with some, some plastic. So, um, painter, like in the painting section, you'll find like, uh, six mil plastic, four mil plastic, two mil plastic, just anything like that. That'll keep the, you know, keep the cold weather out. Um, and the wind from damaging the crops early on in the season. It'll also generate a lot of heat quickly. So, you know, as the sun comes up, it'll start to heat up that, that area in the soil. And at some point you may want to take that plastic off during the day. Yeah. So, I mean, for people who are doing the little raised bed gardens though, like, and their compost is like super movable and this, these like pipes, these like plexi or um, flexible little like tubes that you're talking about to make a hoop with, um, it might not stick in the soil. So if it doesn't stick in the soil, you guys can just buy like some one by two um, really cheap wood and kind of screw together like a triangle, not a triangle, like a rectangle or a square, and then um, screw the tubes to the 
edges to each side and make, you know, a half circle. And that creates something that you can put your plastic over. Hopefully that makes sense. It looks like a greenhouse or a hoop house that you would see out on farms, but it's just a little mini version of it. And what I liked about that is that you can just literally take the whole thing <laughs> off and on. And it was, I mean, it was clunky and cumbersome, but it worked and it did the job. So that is something that uh, for backyard gardener gardeners, if you're really wanting to get ahead and um, have the best garden in your neighborhood, uh, making sure that you're protecting your crops and getting them in early is something that you can do to get ahead. All right, so let's talk a little bit, Kyle, about what, um, what do we do if we wanna start our seeds inside instead of going out and having to buy all of our plants for like four or five times the cost if we wanna start our backyard garden or a small farm? Well, those are two different things. So if you're gonna start a small backyard garden, um, the easiest way to do it is to go get some small plant trays at the hardware store or uh, your local plant store, right? They're called 10, 10, 20 trays is what they're typically called. And they can come with cells in them. So sheets of cells that they could be 36 count, 72 count, 96 count, et cetera. They come in different sizes. So um, for, for most home gardeners, like a 72 or a, a 50 cell size is a good start. So um, the, the larger, the better for larger plants, like, um, like a 50 cell might be a good place to start for peppers and tomatoes, for example. Um, or 72s are pretty much good for, for almost everything in a home garden. Um, so you'll start those with some potting soil and uh, you know put your seeds in it and then get them ready to go and then put them on a, on a baker's rack or put them in a window. If you have a baker's rack, get some uh, shop lights, just inexpensive shop lights. You don't have to buy anything expensive. Um, we use some inexpensive LED lighting that was found on Amazon and just keep the lights close to the top of the plants. Yeah. So as they germinate, you want to keep them close. Um, if they're LED, they won't scorch. They won't burn the plants. Um, if they're compact fluorescent, you may have to pay attention to how close the plants get. Like if they touch the light bulbs, they might, might burn the leaves a little bit. But, you know, keeping them in light for, I forget, 12 to 16 hours a day is a good, good way to do that. So, yeah. And it doesn't have to be anything expensive. You know, put it in a windowsill if you, if you don't have any extra lights or room or a baker's rack to, to put things on. You know, here I built a baker's rack that's six, six trays, I think, with two LED lights for each section. And that holds four trays. So it's at 24, 24 trays at one time that I can start, you know, and that's one rack. <laughs> yeah. So what do you mean by when I said, you know, if they're a backyard gardener or beginning farmer, why is that different? Well, if you're a backyard gardener or if you're a beginning, beginning farmer, you're going to have to approach it differently because um, you just won't be able to grow enough food, you know, to sell at that mm. scale. If you're talking about selling at a farmer's market, got it. But I mean, if they want to just have a small farm for their own, for their family, it would be the same thing. You're going to be starting the seeds the same way as if it was a backyard garden, or if it was just, you know, a small farm for growing food for your family. Um, right. So, and that, that high tunnel idea we talked about is something you can do once, once there's a less of a threat for poor weather, you can just maybe make a little low tunnel outdoors and put your plant trays in that low tunnel outdoors so that you don't have to use artificial light and you can just let the sun do its job. Right. And that is, that brings me to the point, like, what do you feel? I remember when I was doing these backyard, you know, our, our beds and really <laughs> trying to not fail at the, at the backyard garden thing. Like I got really obsessed with starting the seeds inside, making sure that they're not leggy, 
which is why Kyle said to keep the, the, the lights close to the plants. So when you see the seeds pop out of the soil, you want to be sure that those grow lights, if you're using them, are like one, two, maximum three inches away from the plant. Otherwise, the plant is going to reach really, really hard to get to the light and it's going to get leggy and weak. So we want to make sure that the plant is very close to the light and then you can move the light up as the plant grows. But then I got really um, obsessed with hardening off the plants. Like, I know that, how do you feel about that? Because what that means is you take the plants from an indoor setting and put them outside, but we have to do it just for a few hours a day um, until they're acclimated to the outside weather. Um, do you have any suggestions for people that like, maybe they work a nine to five job and they're not going to be able to babysit their plants, um, but they want to make sure that they're going to survive going from an indoor setting out to an outdoor setting when it's time to plant them. Sure. It doesn't take, it doesn't take long. I mean, you don't have to go set them out for half a day. So, you know, if you get before, if you get home from work and there's still some sunlight and a little bit of a breeze, take your plants, set them outside for a couple hours and then bring them in. So it's just a little bit, you want to shock them. I don't know if shock's the wrong word, but train them to, to the difference or the changes in the environment. You know, if you're starting these in your house, they're 68, 72 degrees, whatever, and, and no wind. So um, by moving them outside for a couple hours, it, it allows them to start to um, um, harden. Um, I can't think of the word I want to use, but um, yeah, hard not become accustomed to the, the changes in temperature and actually the the, the breeze or, or the wind that moves across them actually helps strengthen the plants so it's almost like like going to the gym like it kind of gives them a little bit of a workout so yeah yeah exactly it's like training a muscle like you just have to do a little bit at a time or like training your gut microbiome to start eating whole foods, whole plant foods versus the processed foods that we might be accustomed to. So little by little, and how long would you say to do that for like a week? And then it's good to go. Yeah, probably a week. Keep the plants outside after that. Um, they have to just get strong enough to be able to survive outside. So that's just something to note. Make sure that you don't take your indoor plants that you've worked so hard on um, you know, sprouting and germinating and then take them straight outside and expect them to survive. That's why it's also so important to keep them protected from the wind with these little hoop house or little low tunnel situations. Um, you can also look into buying little greenhouse boxes. That's another option if you have a very small backyard um, and you want to be sure that you're protecting your plants. That is something that you can look up like on Amazon or Etsy. I've been seeing a lot of people on Facebook um, marketplace selling um, lifted raised beds that you don't even have to put down on the ground, but they're just like on legs. Um, so that's something that you could look into doing as well. All right, Kyle, what do you, what, what crops do you suggest that people start? Um, if you had to just off the whim, I know you didn't study for this, but like off the whim, maybe four or five things that people can start for their backyard garden in a seed tray right now. And it's February, by the way. Oh, it's almost February. <clears throat> oh, we're not quite there for tomatoes, really. So you may want to wait another month before you start your tomatoes. You can do cabbages, uh, broccoli, some of those cold crops. Um, oh. Those would work. Yeah, let me interrupt you first with the cold crops again, because what you said is that you put them in the ground too late, which was like April, right? Or something like that. Maybe May. I, yeah, the, I don't remember that. It Here in Indiana, late. we get little windows of opportunity to plant and then it gets really wet for the spring and then you can't do anything until it dries out. So I don't remember if it was April or May, but yeah, it was way too late. Okay, but there are cold crops and those cold, cold. crops. C-O-L-E, cold C -O -L -E, crops. C-O-L-E, right. But they're also, AKA, cold crops. Like they thrive in colder weather. Kale thrives in colder weather. Cabbage thrives in colder weather. They, colder weather, they get sweeter. And broccoli and cauliflower. So like those crops, you're saying we could do twice? Like we could basically, we could grow those twice in one year. So we could grow those early, really early. Like those could be the first. And then- the last things that we plant. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah, so you can you can do two plantings, one in the one in the early spring and one in the one in the 
the late summer that'll be for fall. Um, you mentioned a good one. Kale is great right now. Get, you can get the kale started. It's very hardy. And then kale will last you all year round. So that's what I was first trying to think about. That's why it took me a minute. I was trying to find or think about some of the plants that you can grow one set of and harvest from it from the entire season. So kale is a great example of that. Uh, rainbow shard is another one. Yeah. Rainbow shard, you can harvest all year round. Um, you know, actually at a home, in a home, home garden, um, look for sprouting broccoli. So don't worry about growing broccoli heads because they take up a lot of space and you get one cutting. There's some varieties out there that are called sprouting broccoli. And what they do is that it'll, it'll still have its main shoot, but you can harvest that early. So don't let it grow giant. Harvest it early when it's maybe two or three inches wide. At that point, the plant will start to put out shoots and it will shoot all the way around on the outside of the plant for 20 or 30 weeks. So you can actually go out and harvest little florets uh, off of that plant all season long. So it's also a lot easier to manage. Um, it won't bolt as fast. So you know, maybe looking at sprouting broccoli for a home garden, that would be a really good, um, really good alternative. Awesome. That's so fun. Okay. So we've got those few things started. We've got cabbage, kale, we've got Swiss chard. Arugula is a good, a good one that like definitely doesn't like hot. So arugula is one that you would want to do more in the colder. Um, all right. So now I feel like every gardener wants to do well with tomatoes. What do you say? Because I know that we grow our tomatoes vertically. We, if you've, if you've got like a greenhouse, I mean, if you're like a full fledged, like you're going to do this thing, you know, on a small scale for your family and like growing a lot of food and you've got a greenhouse, you could grow your tomatoes vertically up, a, up a string like we do. Um, but what do you say for the backyard gardener or one person that has, I don't know, four or five tomato plants, how are they going to get the most tomatoes? What do they need to do to the plant to make sure that it bears fruit? I feel like tomatoes are complicated. Some people get a little bit overwhelmed with them. Maybe it's just me. Yeah, so there's a couple couple things. Um, tomatoes need to have consistent watering. So if you have the ability to put like a little timer on your, um, your garden hose or something, um, consistent watering is very important. They also like fertile soil, so they need they need a lot of food. They need fed well. They need they need fertilized consistently and often. So, and not a high nitrogen fertilizer. So, if you use a high nitrogen fertilizer, they will be giant plants with very little fruit. Mm -hmm. So, you want something that has more phosphorus and potassium in it, and that will help them bud and bloom throughout the season. Um, don't constrain them. So, a lot of times I see people buying these little tiny wire racks at the hardware store that are you know, they're real tiny at the bottom. They go up like this a little bit in their, their funnels. I think those are really poor for most potato, most tomatoes at home. I like if you have the ability to build a raised bed garden, you know, with some two by twelves, um, go get a, what's called a hog panel. It's a piece of fence. Tractor supply sells it for like 20 bucks. Stick that in the ground with a couple stakes. And then you can trellis up the, the, the thing, up the, uh, the fence, up the fence. They're like, I don't know, eight feet long, maybe about four or five feet tall. And they make a great trellis. And then that way you can train your plants to grow up um, those panels and they'll hang off and they'll get good, good um, sunlight, airflow. That's the other thing. Those little, those little round wire basket thingies, they restrict airflow. So it, it also um, can cause disease in the plant. So mm -hmm. airflow, sunlight, um, you know, that method really is helpful. Okay. Another thing you can do with that panel, that, that piece of fence is early, like March, you can uh, plant peas, sweet peas. Mm. So before you plant your tomatoes, plant peas and let them grow up those panels and vine out. And then in May, plant your tomatoes right next to the peas. And, you know, once the peas kind of die out, um, you can pull those out and the tomatoes are ready to kind of take over. So it's a good way to make, make use good use out of a little bit of space out of a small space. Yeah. And if people can't do a big, like hog panel, like you said, I remember your dad did build like cages for the tomato plants. That was more so to protect them from, 
predators, but also to help them grow, I feel. And it wasn't a funnel shape. It, it was made out of like square wire, yeah. but it, it was, was made like out a, of fence. It was yeah. made out of old fence, but those were a lot larger. So that's, that's for somebody who's going to have a garden in their yard. And they, yeah. you know, they were maybe four feet wide, four feet around. So four feet in diameter. Yeah. And they you were know, cylindrical. So, yeah. It was just a cylinder. Um, okay. So for people to get a lot of fruit, you said phosphorus, potassium versus too much nitrogen because nitrogen promotes rooting and promotes oh, nitrogen promotes growth, green, like green growth, green growth and rooting Whereas the others. I forget phosphorus pr promotes rooting and potassium promotes blooming and blossoms and fruit. Okay. So do we need to do anything else to our tomato plants? Do we need to pull off leaves? Do we need to pull off like what, do, anything special? Because I know there's, there's determinate and there's indeterminate. There's two different varieties of tomatoes. Yeah. So for a home gardener, I wouldn't worry much about it. So a determinate variety is a variety that will grow set fruit for a, a limited period of time and then die out. So you might get one major flush or a couple major, major flush, two major flushes of tomatoes and, and then they then they're done an indeterminate variety is a variety that will continue to grow vine and fruit and you know blossom and fruit so an indeterminate varieties in my opinion are are, are the best for long-term season um, growth and for you know getting tomatoes as long as you can um, and then they they're really the the pruning is up to you you can prune if you feel like it's overgrowing um, but, but really pruning in a home garden is not, not really a, a necessity in my opinion, compared to like a, like a production grower. Okay. All right. Is there any message or any tips that you want to leave our listeners with when it comes to starting their backyard garden and any words of wisdom from the farmer? Plant more than you think you'll eat because the neighbors will eat it. And I don't mean like your next door neighbor, I'm talking about like the fox, the, the rabbit, the squirrel, the, you know, the animals in the area, they'll eat, they'll eat a little bit. So plant more than you think you'll, you'll use. Um, you can plant a lot denser than, than a lot of times you'll read on the packages. So in a square foot garden, for example, or a, a, a raised bed garden, you can plant things a lot denser, closer together. So, um, you know, except tomatoes. Full. Except, except tomatoes. well, except for tomatoes and take, yeah, but, um, but yeah, green, pack it full. Yeah. Greens. I feel like the package totally like gyps you. You're like, it's like, they'll tell you to plant lettuce, like, I don't know, five inches apart, but you plant them close and you could get like baby lettuces out of them and you could get a lot. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so plant more plant dense, anything else? Consistently water. So again, get an inexpensive garden timer for your home, you know, hose bib and just set it to go, set it to water a couple times a week. Mm -hmm. That way you can kind of set it and forget it. And if people don't have that elevated of a system and they're just using a hose, what do you suggest? Do they get a shower head thing to go on a sprinkle, like a sprayer? Should they spray at the down at the base of the plants instead of sprinkling just the leaves? Like, what do you suggest? Because I do know a lot of people are going to have that question. Yeah. So always try to water in, at the soil level if possible. Uh, it does a couple of things. It, it keeps, um, it, it reduces the amount of potential for like uh, fungus or rotting of plants. So I mentioned plant dense, right? So if you plant plants dense <clears throat> and you water from above and they can't get any airflow or sunlight, they can potentially get diseased or rot. So I always water if I can with a drip system or at the base of the plants. Mm -hmm. Okay. You want to water at the root zone and not, not the top of the plant. Got it. Okay. Good. Very good tip. All right, honey. I know that you are itching to go to like tractor supply or wherever you like to go in the mornings. And Cohen is in the office behind me cutting. I don't think that he was too loud during the episode. I appreciate your time. I know other people will as well. And 
Thanks for being such an awesome farmer and inspiration to so many people. We love you. Bye.